Good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I hope you're well this morning. Uh, before we begin, can I remind you to turn off uh, your mobile phones, anything else that might uh, make a beep, uh, a beep during uh, this session. My name is Mark Russ, and I'm one of the tutors here at Woodbrook. And it's a pleasure to welcome Paul Rogers as our speaker this morning. Paul is Professor of Peace Studies at the University of Bradford. Born in East London, Paul began his academic life as a biologist and worked as a senior scientific officer in Kenya and Uganda before developing an interest in international relations and conflict. In 1979, Paul joined the University of Bradford and what was still a relatively new Department of Peace Studies. This year, the department celebrates its 40th anniversary. Paul continues his work on trends in international conflict with a particular focus on the interactions of socio-economic divisions and environmental constraints. Within this area of study, he works on issues such as the politics of energy resource use and the impact of climate change on international security. He has a particular research interest in radicalization and political violence and his regional emphasis is primarily on the Middle East and South Asia. He is international security editor for the independent global media platform, Open Democracy, and has been writing a weekly column on global security since the 28th of September, 2001. He also writes a monthly briefing for the Oxford Research Group. His latest book, for which there are flyers on the table here at the front, please do take one, is um, Irregular War, ISIS and the New Threat from the Margins. Paul lectures regularly and internationally. Uh, he enjoys bell ringing, or so I hear from the Guardian website. Uh, <laughs> he is married with four sons and an increasing number of grandchildren. Um, we will uh, have a, a, sh a short period of silence, and when Paul feels ready, he will uh, come and speak to you, after which we will have time for questions and responses. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mark. Um, the business about increasing numbers of grandchildren is that um, we had grandchildren twins just four weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, our eldest son and his wife uh, live and work in Switzerland, and my wife and I are going out to see them a week today, which will be very nice. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me here this morning. It's a real pleasure to be back at Woodbrook. I've been a frequent visitor here. I should say I'm not a Quaker myself, but of course the Department of Peace Studies at Bradford, for those of you who don't know, was very much an inspiration by the Quakers. In fact, a group of Quakers got together, well, about 45 years ago, actually, originally, to try and get a Peace Studies Centre established at a British university. We had them in the Stockholm Peace Research Centre, the Oslo Peace Research Institute and the like, but there was nothing directly in Britain apart from the small but very good Richardson Institute down in London. Uh, Bradford was very interested. We had a, quite a radical vice chancellor at the time, and his deputy was a Quaker, Robert McKinley, and Peace Studies came to Bradford. And as Mark said, I, I joined a few years afterwards. Um, personally, I suppose I was brought up a Catholic, but I would be a, a non theist, although a few years ago I was speaking down at one of the Quaker national gatherings in Britain at the University of Kent. And uh, I was chatting to people in the afternoon. I was on a fringe meeting in the evening for the Quaker Peace Studies Trust. And he said, are you a Quaker, Paul? I said, no, I'm not. I'm a sort of a non-theist. He said, what are you worried about? The non-theist Quakers are having a picnic this afternoon. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there may be hope for me yet sometime. Um, well, thanks very much. As Mark said, I've, I've had a long-term interest in sort of the underlying reasons for international conflict and possibly the changing reasons. Uh, and this is why I'm particularly interested in this kind of confluence between socioeconomic divisions and marginalization <laughs> and the increasing impact of environmental constraints. Uh, 
and I see those as the, the really the key things over the next 30 years. So this is broad brush stuff. I'm looking 20, 30 years ahead and may get it absolutely and completely wrong. But I did work for Oxford Research Group at a time when they were almost the only group saying don't go to war in Afghanistan and they were the only ones who did a serious analysis about the dangers of going to war in Iraq. So at least that group does have a little bit of a prescient record, so maybe I'm on reasonably firm ground there. Um, but I've also been very interested in the whole issue of political violence. I got involved in this by doing work on how the provisional IRA worked in the 1990s. And putting it all together towards the end of the 90s, it seemed there was a real risk that the kind of sort of catastrophic attacks which were possible then might actually occur and might be linked with the developments in the Middle East. And the emphasis, therefore, was to try and link together. And what I've tried to do recently, and emphasize try, is put together uh, the wider idea of what are going to be the world driving of conflicts with the experience of the last 15 years of the war on terror. And what then that tells us about how states might, in a sense, react uh, to new kinds of problems, problems that they will see as threats from the margins, hence the subtitle of the book. So I'd like to give that a go, if I may, um, maybe for about 40 minutes. Uh, if I go on any longer, would people at the front get restless, or Mark, would you butt in, because we want to have at least half the time for discussion, knowing uh, the sort of the kind of issues that this raises. Uh, what I'd like to do, first of all, is to really go through basically the underlying drivers of the socioeconomic divide and environmental constraints, and then add on um, the usual way that we respond when we get serious threats, which is basically what I call the control paradigm, or crudely lidism. You keep the lid on things rather than going underneath to what the, the nature of the problems are and where they're coming from. So I want to look at that. Then I want to look at what has been the actual experience since 9-11, and what that tells us about how we might respond in the future if we don't take the much more sensible paths uh, of actually going to the underlying problems and get into grips with the failing world economic model and the failure so far sufficiently to address climate change. Um, this obviously is very tough stuff. It could be very pessimistic stuff. Uh, but what I would say at this stage is that I got into this field in the 1980s working on nuclear issues and for the last, what, 20 or so years, I've been working mainly on political violence and long-term security trends. If you're working in that sort of field, you end up with three choices. You're alcoholic, suicidal, or optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink much, and I'm here. So <laughs> at least personally, I think there may be some chance. Um, let's start, if I may, with the, uh, the, the, the issue of the socioeconomic divide. We moved into what we broadly call the more neoliberal economic model about 40 years ago, Thatcherism, Reaganism, and the rest. It came in in the late 1970s uh, with a load of work done in the right-wing think tanks before that, and we've moved progressively into a world in which you have uh, a much greater degree of privatization, much less of a welfare system, uh, and a system which is rooted far more in the profit economy. And essentially, uh, that is the way things have gone. It got a huge boost with the end of the centrally planned, the rigid centrally planned economic system of the Soviet Union at the end of the 1980s, early 1990s. And this is where we're more or less at now. And in spite of some of the problems that we've seen with the huge recession in 2008, 2009, it seems to be going that way still. There's no real change. In parallel with that, there's been a very distinct increase in divisions, economic divisions, really market. I mean, the Oxfam report four or five months ago illustrated this with the extent to which 70 or so million people, uh, the 1% control so much of the world's wealth. And if you're looking at the sort of the richest fifth of the world's population, which probably includes most, if not almost all of us here, then that richest fifth certainly controls uh, around about 90% of the income and the wealth. Now, the thing is, that is a trend which has been continuing, uh, and it's developed really over the last 30, 40 years. It's not that the world was equal 40 years ago, far from it, but overall, the division has actually widened, and all the signs are that it is widening still more. Um, it's true that the, the poorest billion of the people in the world 
are maybe slightly less poor than they were, but it's marginal. We're talking about one and a half dollars a day instead of one dollar a day. Uh, it's true that many people right across the, the, the world as a whole uh, have a tolerable life, uh, but with huge problems on the margins. But it's the difference that counts. You see it very clearly if you peer underneath and look at the driving forces behind the Arab awakening of five or six years ago. I mean, just to give you one snapshot, um, if you look at that period over the last five or six years, the one country that is actually making a slow, steady transition to more representative governance has been Tunisia. Others have made progress and there have been some reforms. Others have been really heavy repression. And we saw what has happened there in Syria. But if you take Tunisia, it's also a country which, for the size of its population, is actually sending more people to join the likes of ISIS than any other country across the Middle East and North Africa. Now, how can that be? And one of the answers, probably the most important answer, is the problems within the Tunisian economy that you have in that country out of a population of 11 million people, at a recent estimate, 140,000 unemployed graduates. People are more as relatively on the margins. And there are many people worried about the current state of affairs in Egypt, where the government is repressing any kind of Islamic-related opposition. But you have huge numbers of people who are not part. They do not have good life chances. And so you have this as a, a really a very wide issue. Uh, but it is something which is actually steadily getting worse, not better. The socioeconomic divide is widening, not narrowing. It's widening within countries such as Britain, but it's widening worldwide. But at the same time, we have a transglobal elite of many hundreds of millions of people, maybe up to 1.5 billion people. It's not so clearly cut, rich world, poor world, as it was in my youth, you know, back in the 1950s and 1960s. It's basically not rich countries, poor countries. It's different to that. There are probably far more people who will be described as wealthy and middle class in China than there are in Britain, and possibly even in India as well. But it's the difference which counts, and that is a worldwide phenomenon. Within that, though, there's been uh, something which has been an incredibly positive development. Worldwide, the levels of education, literacy and communications are far better than, uh, than 40 years ago. Uh, my first job, as uh, Mark mentioned, was actually working in Uganda. Uh, this is actually pre-Armin, which really dates me. It's the late 1960s. But at that time, a relatively modest proportion of young kids in Uganda went through a full four or five years of primary education. The government was doing its best, and the gender gap was not as bad there as in many other countries. You go back to Uganda now, and where there was one very small university college, a good one, a Makerere, you now have, I don't know, what is it, 10 or 12 universities. And the point is, there's been this transformation worldwide. It's a great success. There's even slowly being an improvement in the gender divide, although in some parts of the world, that's still extremely bad. But the point about all this is that people are more knowledgeable of their own marginalization. And this is a global phenomenon. Um, some of the older ones among us from Britain will remember, I'm not sure you had this phrase in the United States, in the 1970s, sociologists used to talk about what they call the revolution of rising expectations. And basically what this meant was that, you know, you may have people relatively poor and on the margins, but everybody looked that things were going to get better. Now it's much more the revolution of frustrated expectations. And that, I think, is the issue that we face, which is just not widely recognised. And in extreme circumstances, it can lead to very strong revolts. The, the neo-Maoist Naxalite revolt in India would be a very significant marker here. So that's the first overall trend, and it is not reversing. And that's the key thing. The second issue inevitably relates to uh, environmental constraints. Now, one could go through all the different ones of these. I worked myself early, uh, early in my career in tropical agriculture, but I'll concentrate on the big issue, which is climate change. Now, again, we need to put this in perspective. Um, until about, what, um, 30, 35 years ago, um, there wasn't any recognition, fully full recognition, that the global community was impacting on the entire global environment. Uh, there were many examples of local impacts. You know, you go right back to the Stockholm Environment Conference of 1972, 
And that was very much about the big pollution and land dereliction problems, mainly affecting the industrialised north. It is true that just a few months before that conference, that incredible seminal book, Limits to Growth, was published. Donella Meadows and her team at MIT uh, published this book, which was the first uh, systems analysis study of the entire global system. And they were saying that we were heading to the point where the global system, the, ecos the biosphere, would not be able to handle increases in impacts caused by human activity. Um, they were, incidentally, not saying that this was an imminent threat. They were actually saying that on the trends that they'd identified back in the early 1970s, the problems would hit the world around about 2020 onwards. And they were not really factoring hugely climate change at the time because the impact of that wasn't fully understood. They were looking at a whole range of other resource factors. But essentially the world is limited in terms of its capacity to actually accept uh, changes in the environment induced by human activity. We first learned that that could be global fairly precisely in 1983. And that was essentially when you had the first results of the ozone depletion study, uh, where it was found that ozone in the upper atmosphere was being depleted at quite a rapid rate uh, due to certain chemicals which seem to be inert at ground level, the chlorofluorocarbons, things used as the propellants in fire extinguishers, in refrigerants. Uh, they were used as the gas to pack Big Mac packaging and the rest. But it was found that the ozone layer was in danger of being you know, in serious trouble, and that ozone layer fil filters out a lot of the most dangerous ultraviolet light, UVB. And they discovered a hole appearing in the ozone layer over Antarctic, Antarctica every spring due to some unusual stability conditions in the atmosphere at the time. The interesting thing about that is when that was recognised, they got an international agreement to start phasing out these chemicals within four years, the Montreal Convention of, I think it was 87 or 88. So people can react. That was fairly easy because chlorofluorocarbons could be replaced by other things and in fact, there was only one major manufacturer, a huge company, Dow, which could produce many other things as well. The bad side, though, is that even so, it has taken decades for the ozone layer to start to sort of be fully repaired. And even now, as some of you know, people in southern Argentina, southern Chile, Tasmania, South Island and New Zealand are far more cautious about um, sunburn than in most other parts of the world because they're closer to that sort of problem. So it's good and bad news. The climate, the, the, the atmosphere, the biosphere can take a long time to recover, but it can recover if action is taken. But of course, the issue is carbon dioxide and carbon pollution is of a different order of magnitude because this is actually deep within how we work as a society. Um, I just want to tease out a couple of things about this. I know I'm going fairly quickly through a lot of different things, but I'll try and sort of keep to the essence of it. What we know about climate change is first we should call it climate disruption, not climate change. The second thing is it is asymmetric. It is occurring at different rates in different parts of the world. And the third thing is it is broadly tending to accelerate. One of the complications is that because the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going up pretty steadily, but there are other things which go up and down, up and down, cooling and warming, cooling and warming, natural things, Basically, if you get a period when the natural cycle is a little bit down, then that actually plateaus out the rate at which the overwarming is happening. And that was happening until about two years ago, for about five years. And that meant that the climate skeptics and deniers could say, it isn't happening, we haven't got a problem. Over the last two years, uh, the major one of these natural oscillations, what we call the southern oscillation, El Niño, La Niña, as people call it, to more accurate, well, well, that's part of it, that actually has been in sync with the overall trend, and the end result is quite extraordinary. The last 13 months worldwide have been the warmest of those months ever recorded. And the record in, I think it was January and February, was nearly one degree centigrade higher than any other month since accurate records began nearly 100 years ago. So there's been this sudden acceleration. It'll slow down a little bit the next three or four years as El Nino is in a different part of the cycle. But what is clear is the overall tendency is to go up. As far as asymmetry is concerned, well, it used to be thought that the tropics would largely be buffered against climate change. Uh, that was an early error 20 or 30 years ago. And it's now reckoned that the tropics, but particularly the northern and southern subtropics, 
are going to be particularly badly affected. The area that is already accelerating much faster than elsewhere is what we call the near Arctic, the Paleoarctic. Uh, and that is also already calling, uh, causing a very major uh, decrease in sea ice each summer, which means, incidentally, you get more open water, which absorbs more sunlight, which means the ice, uh, ice melts even quicker. That's a lot of positive feedback. And there are other possible examples of that. There are also a very strong fear that the Amazonian rainforest will be seriously drying out on present trends within 30 years. And that is one of the world's great carbon sinks. One of the other world of the world's great carbon sinks are the vast boreal forests of the near Arctic. And we've seen a very big increase in wildfires in those in recent years. And of course, the Fort McMurray incident when a city had to be evacuated in Canada, that got the intention, but that fire was not especially big it was just in the wrong place, close to a large city. And essentially what we saw there was that that was an indicator of a wider development. What this all means is that climate change has to be addressed as an absolutely core issue. And we're not talking about moving in the northern industrialised countries you know, to cuts in 40 or 50% in carbon dioxide outputs. We're needing 80% cutbacks, certainly by 2030, if not before. And you could say, well, it ain't going to happen, but I'll come on to that in a little bit. But it's when you put these together that I think you get the key thing, because what we're facing is a combination of a more divided world, which is more constrained. Now, over 40 years ago, I was involved with some ecologist friends in trying to do a bit of work on this. I was working at Huddersfield Polytechnic, where they had a very pioneering course called Human Ecology, trying to bring together economics, politics, and ecology. Uh, and uh, there was a seminar which was run, and one of the people who spoke at it was a, a remarkable guy, a politician, and also a senior lecturer in geography over at Liverpool University by the name of Edwin Brooks. And he, wrote, he gave a very prescient paper saying what would happen if we didn't get control of our environment and our economies. And he had one particular phrase which I memorised and I've used repeatedly, so if you don't mind, I'll repeat it. He said, what we have to avoid is a dystopia of a world in which we have, quotes, a crowded, glowering planet of massive inequalities of wealth, buttressed by stark force, yet endlessly threatened by desperate men in the global ghettos. And I think the use of the term men is probably intentional. But this is what he was saying, and the problem is we're, frankly, a lot closer to that 40 years later. Um, how will this express itself? Well, uh, one of the very clearest ways, if you put the combination of economic differentials with knowledge, with climate disruption, is a huge increase in migratory pressures. Massive. Uh, provisional work which has been done by one group in Oxford suggests that at the present time, plus and minus in, in any one group of years, you may have something like 40 million people who are displaced or basically trying to move with half of them across boundaries. And the estimate was that that would go up tenfold if climate change really kicks in. Now we're seeing almost day by day what is happening in Britain based on the basis of fear of migrants. And we've seen what's happened recently, not just in terms of the economic migrants trying to get in from sub-Saharan Africa, but the terrible situation of the refugees in, in the Middle East. We're talking about pressures which are hugely greater than that, which will be resisted by states at the receiving end, um, where they will be prey to politicians who will always look to the poorer sectors of society who most fear migrants. And we're seeing this, I mean, it's unfolding almost hour by hour uh, as we lead up to this Brexit vote. But that is basically, that's a small-scale marker of what we would have uh, if we actually allow the current combination to continue. Um, how would you respond? Well, I'll come at the end to the positive aspects, but just to remind you, what we tend to do is to see these as threats from the margins against us, and we react by using force. Um, I'll tell one brief anecdote. About, I think it was three years ago, I had an email out of the blue uh, from a group at Oxford University who ran the Changing Character of War program, a very interesting uh, academic program. And one of them said, we're running a seminar on the risk of insecurity stemming from weak and failing states. Uh, we have a group of people who are specialists in particular regions. Would you be willing to come down and give a, an overview at the start of where you think the world's going overall? I'm not a specialist in weak and failing states. 
and it seemed very intriguing to do. You know, got free reign to say what you think, uh, and then listen to some really knowledgeable people for a day. Um, but they weren't actually too clear as to who the audience would be. Uh, and I got the idea it was probably some diplomats. It was a sort of a government-run thing. So I went down and I found out, in fact, it was the commandant and the senior officers of all the SAS, the British Special Forces, with people from the Special Boat Service and also people from MI6 and Defence Intelligence staff. About 30 of them, and they do actually meet about once a year or so, funded by a private foundation, not by the taxpayer, to look ahead. Now, I only mention this because I gave this kind of analysis that I've just done now. A um, person who spoke immediately after me was a, a woman who actually worked for Islamic Relief, which is actually based in Birmingham, a large charity, nearly as big as Christian Aid, and she was a British convert to Islam, and she gave a very good interpretation of what was happening in many of the semi-arid Middle Eastern countries that Islamic Relief deals a lot with. What she also said, though, departing from a script, she said, I want to go back to what something Paul Rogers said. You do need to know that probably the biggest single issue get raised by our field staff is the existing impact of climate change on agriculture. Existing, not future. And that, I think, is the difference. Uh, my wife and I have had a small, small holding in the East Pennines for about 40, 45 years. Uh, and about 15 years ago, I planted a small open-air vineyard. Uh, it, my wife calls it a vignette. It's only about the twice the size of this room. <laughs> but the very fact that you can grow grapes uh, there, uh, you know, is an indicator. Uh, pro it's probably the only thing you remember about the entire morning, oh, vineyard near Huddersfield, but, but never mind. But essentially, it's just a marker of what is actually happening. Uh, and, and just relating to the work you were doing in the cellar of this building just a night or so ago, um, one of my friends is an applied meteorologist, and he told me about three or four years ago, he said, you know, Paul, we're getting these very intense downpours, we should not be surprised. Because essentially, if the Atlantic is warming up very slightly, that means the winds going across it pick up more moisture and they let it down more suddenly when they get to land. I mean, the sort of rainfall we've experienced is like I remember in Uganda in the rainy season. Absolutely intense. Anyway, that, that's a diversion. Climate change is happening. And we also have the attitude of maintaining control. So the tendency will be, if you get major problems, if need be, you have to use military force. It's the control paradigm or lidism. So that, if you like, is the background. I just want to talk fairly briefly about the efforts to use lidism over the last 15 years uh, and what we've seen happen. Now, in one sense, I think it's fair to say uh, that if you look at the situation in the United States in September 2001, that was at a time when the Bush administration had just come in uh, the neoconservative view of international relations was very strong. Uh, basically, you had people who were either neocons or assertive realists in key positions, Rumsfeld, uh, Cheney, Wolf of Witz, uh, John Bolton and the rest. And essentially, I think it would be fair to say that any state which, uh, which experienced the sheer shock of 9-11 would react extremely vigorously. But a state which believed that it was really... Uh, at, the, uh, at the start of what would be the new American century, it was even more grievous. And I don't think there was any state which would not react very strongly and seek to basically defeat where the threat was coming from, which was assumed to be the Taliban-controlled uh, territory in Afghanistan and al-Qaeda within it. And so you had the decision to go to war in Afghanistan with very strongly uh, support from Europeans. I mean, Le Mans in France, a liberal newspaper, had as his banner headline on September the 12th, 2001, we are all Americans now. And I think there was strong support at that time. There were a few people, um, Walden Bellow particularly, who were arguing, you go to war and this is what Al-Qaeda wants. You're actually being provoked. I think that was a very tall order to get any state, let alone the Bush administration, not to take that route. But it was taken. But if you remember, using an extraordinary combination of the Northern Alliance, ground forces, special forces, and very intensive air bombing, you actually had the Taliban, um, well, you could say um, terminated, but in fact melted away within about eight or ten weeks. And then you had what appeared to be the turnaround, because you had the famous State of the Union address in January 2002, which was when the administration... Uh, took the war from a war against al-Qaeda to a war against an axis of evil. Mm 
And that was really the start of a, um, of a much wider view. And it was abundantly clear that Iraq would be the, the first candidate for regime termination. Um, I, within Europe, there were three states that more or less backed that. There was Tony Blair's Britain, there was Berlusconi's Italy, and then, of course, there was the Spanish as well. But even by the early months of 2002, there was this unease in Paris, in Berlin and elsewhere, about what appeared to be a much more widening concept. Uh, but essentially, of course, uh, from, a, from a Bush administration perspective, in a sense, there'd been the right kind of response to the atrocity of 9-11, and things were beginning to get back on track. And if you could actually get rid of the Saddam Hussein regime, you would actually get the beginnings of the real remaking of the Middle East. Uh, again, I would just, one other very quick an anecdote. I was at a meeting in Washington in March 2002, which was actually a UN-sponsored one, when they were looking at overall trends. And I actually met up with a couple of people who'd been in the transition team of the Bush administration, and very much assertive realists. And there was a group of us meeting over lunch, some from Europe and some from the US, including these two people. And the conversation got round to this feel, March 2002, that the next target would be Iraq. Uh, and, you know, I was saying to one, and I said, well, you know, in Europe, there's, there's very mixed feelings about this. There's opposition developing. People actually fear that, you know, if you go to war in Iraq, you're doing what al-Qaeda wants, and you're going to end up with an insurgency, not a liberation. And one of them looked at me and said, you don't get it, do you, Paul? I said, clearly not. He said, this isn't about Iraq. This is about Iran. If we get Iraq right, the Iranians will behave themselves. And his view was, and I think it was a view within the administration, that if you get Iraq going, quotes, pro-West with American bases there, you get all the allied states in the Western Gulf, you get the revitalized Fifth Fleet controlling the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean, and you get the American bases being established at Bagram and Kandahar in Afghanistan, the end result will be Iran behaving itself. And that, again, seemed to work initially. You know, uh, the Saddam Hussein regime collapsed within three weeks. Uh, Bush gave his mission accomplished speech three weeks later on, Mar uh, on May the 1st, 2003, Remember on the flight deck of the USA Abraham Lincoln with the big banner on the tower, mission accomplished? And there again, it didn't work. Uh, and you had you know, the development of a very bitter insurgency, which was last for many years. Meanwhile, Afghanistan was actually beginning to become unstable. There wasn't the aid put in to help stabilize it. The Europeans did not play ball on this, and Washington was really diverted into Iraq. And so we had the beginnings of what is now an ongoing war in Afghanistan, with the news just yesterday that Obama is probably going to take the difficult decision to increase the American commitment at a combat level back in Afghanistan. So 15 years on, you have this problem. And let me just say one thing before we look more to the future, is where in all of this is ISIS coming from? Now, I think it's actually you need to disentangle that, because what has happened over the last 15 years is initially, you go back to 2001, and Donald Rumsfeld essentially believed that the way to maintain uh, security, or if you like, maintain control, was what was called war light. You would not put hundreds of thousands of boots on the ground overseas ever again. The reality instead was that it became war heavy. And at peak, there were about 170,000, I think it was, Western troops in Iraq. And in Afghanistan, just four years ago, there were 140,000 troops. But what has happened over the last 10 years is a recognition that that is not the best, quotes, way to fight wars. So what we see now more and more is a move to what is termed remote warfare or remote control warfare. And so you have a much heavier reliance on armed drones, on privatized military companies, on uh, special forces in particular, and other means which are sort of below the radar, in fact, uh, as far as public opinion is concerned. There is an extraordinary convention in the British Parliament, you do not discuss the actions of British special forces. Uh, and when MPs asked, what is the SAS doing in Iraq or Syria or Libya or Mali or Somalia or Yemen or Afghanistan, the answer comes back, we do not discuss this by convention. So you have no debate on this in Britain except items fed in to the more tabloid newspapers when things go fairly well. And that essentially is the transition which we're seeing. But what it's about overall is maintaining control. But why do I mention this in relation to ISIS? Well, 
essentially, the war in Iraq eventually uh, scaled down by about 2008. It was one of the reasons that Barack Obama was able to fight the 2008 uh, presidential election on a policy of withdrawing from Iraq. And it was thought that basically what had really been in an aspect of the war hardly publicized, the so-called shadow war, a very intense special forces war against the absolute key elements of the insurgency, it was believed that that had worked. Um, they were given free reign, uh, three big American special forces task forces, task groups, and one British one, the SAS, Sabre Squadron. Basically, they were given free reign. At peak, there were at least 300 helicopter run night raids per night, uh, per month, uh, you know, 10 a night, day after day. It was reckoned that about 4,000 of the key insurgents were killed and at least 10,000 detained. And that really apparently took the heart out of the insurgency. There are other elements, but that was the key one. But in reality, enough of the people survived. They got combat training against the most elite Western forces. And when the Americans began to withdraw, and the, uh, the, the, the government in Iraq did not reach out to the Sunni minority, that was when the more radical remnants of what was al-Qaeda in Iraq began to reassemble. And this is really the origins of ISIS, helped hugely by what they were able to achieve in the aftermath of the beginnings of the Syrian, Syrian civil war. So you had the extraordinary situation, this is only four years ago, that you had something arising phoenix-like out of the ashes of what appeared to be al-Qaeda. And essentially, in probably the most remarkable thing of all, the people who survived the special forces raids conducted an astonishing series of prison breaks in 2012, 2013, including the newly reconstructed, very high security prison at, at, um, uh, at Abu Ghraib. And in fact, in Abu Ghraib, they broke out almost all of the 450 highest ranking paramilitary leaders in one single night. Uh, another thousand plus in, in prisons near Mosul. And that is really the basis of the ISIS that we've been facing recently. Aided a lot by the technocratic elements that were essentially sacked by Paul Bremer back in, in what, about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. So essentially that is the core of it. But of course ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, you could describe as a transnational revolutionary movement, but very different from your normal revolutionary movement. Why? Because it is eschatological, it looks beyond this life. And that's the key thing, that's the key difference. So essentially you have a movement now, and in fact Al-Qaeda has not gone away. You have strong elements, the Al-Nusra Front in Syria, uh, you have the, the groups in a number of parts of West Africa, and then you have, even while ISIS is under threat at present, particularly in Fallujah, you actually have it still holding on in Libya, and meanwhile making inroads as far afield as southern Philippines, Kosovo, and we suspect, sadly, even Bangladesh. So in other words, you actually have this kind of phenomenon continuing. Um, I was just rung up this morning by BBC World asking sort of what the views were on Fallujah, and I said, well, it may well fall to the Iraqi forces, but they're backed up very heavily by Iranian militias. Most of their army is Shia. They're basically taking over a city from a very radical Sunni group. Unless you go to the underlying reasons why you have the deep divisions in Iraq and in Iraq through into Iran and Saudi Arabia, this will not be the end of it. And it's, it's, it's basically it's control not going underneath to see the many reasons why we have the problem in the first place. Trying to get that across is actually very difficult. It's extremely difficult with politicians. The curious thing is it's slightly easier with military. And I do get invited to speak to military audiences, and they're very interested in this analysis. But the trouble is, like the talk to the SAS group, they accept the analysis, but their job, let's be clear about that, is to defend their own country or their own alliance. Their job is not to go to stopping problems becoming problems in 20 years' time. That is for other people to do. And this, I think, is the problem about the whole control paradigm. So where, can I take another five or 10 minutes? Is that all right? Um, so where does this leave us? I think the reality is that on present trends, well, that's the absolutely key thing. On present trends, I think there is a kind of risk that we are going to end up in the kind of world 
that Edward, Edwin Brooks was talking about, the crowded, glowering planet. Um, and I must admit, although I'm optimistic most of the time, I think the attitude that Europe has had towards really f refugees coming from terri terribly difficult areas in the last nine months has really so sort of shaken even somebody who is normally fairly optimistic. Uh, I mean, you look at the way in which you have large numbers of refugees trying to get through into the Balkans, being met by razor wire, tear gas, and water cannon. Uh, now, from within Europe, they are a threat. They're seen as a threat. I, I have a, a nephew and his wife who live in Hungary, and they've been horrified at the changing in attitude in Hungarian society. Uh, but the point is, you turn the whole thing around and see how it's viewed across the Middle East and beyond, with very big coverage in Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya. There it is seen that desperate people trying to get to a better place are being f basically the castle gates are closed by the Europeans. And all that will lead to ultimately, frankly, is anger. It may be desperation, but it will be anger as well. So in a sense, we've, we've got to look at the problems in the Middle East, and I haven't even touched on the long-standing Israeli-Palestinian dynamic. But what we've also got to look at is the underlying major drivers, because I think in some ways what we're experiencing now is a marker for what would happen on a much larger scale in 20 or 30 years' time. So if you turn it round now and look really, if you go back to those initial problems of the, the failing economic model worldwide, and the environmental limitations issues. Um, how can you look at those? Uh, what needs to be done, essentially? Well, essentially, in terms of the world economy, very bluntly, there have to be radical changes, almost a transformation <coughs> of the global economic model. This is extremely difficult to get across because, I mean, essentially, when the old rigid, uh, centrally planned economic model of the Soviet era collapsed, there was an, almost an assumption, therefore, that's collapsed. There are only two choices. The other choice must be the right one. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, it must be the way we are going. And of course, it got a boost in the 1990s. Remember turbo capitalism in Russia? Uh, and, and what that ended up for several years was actually having a third of the Russian population below the poverty line and incredible wealth accruing to relatively few people, uh, including a number of owners of Premier League football clubs in Britain at the present time. And you see the sheer wealth that has come into what is considered a fairly safe city called London uh, because of people who actually want somewhere where they feel secure, where they have huge wealth and can buy up very rich properties, very good properties at very high prices. So essentially, you actually have to turn around that entire thing. Now, that is deeply problematic because even the experience of the last four or five years following the economic crisis has not really dented the belief that essentially uh, you can continue as before. I suppose the thing that is most disturbing is the way that people accept uh, the behaviour of the banking system. Now, I can't remember the precise figure, so I'll be a bit cautious here, but I think it's, it's 2012. Um, the United States, whatever the relevant department of government, put a fine of over a billion dollars on a bank because uh, that bank had been basically allowing basically free money to come across its counter unaccounted for. And I think the figure was in excess of $9 billion of basically raw cash coming across without any indication of where it was coming from. But of course, once it had come into the bank, it was, of course, clean money. What had it been before? Who knows? But that bank was HSBC, British-owned and one of the largest banks in the world. I don't think anybody went to jail... I don't think it measured more than maybe a paragraph or so in the Financial Times or The Economist. But you'd had basically um, illegal behaviour on a massive scale. But we seem always to accept it. And that's the real problem. We, we seem to think there is no alternative to this. There are alternatives, many alternatives, and there's some extremely good work being done. Um, I mean, for a start, we tend to forget, largely because they're not prominent in this part of the world, either in the States or in Britain. Worldwide, cooperatives are big. There are 950 million people who are members of cooperatives worldwide, the great majority in the global south. And there are other models. Even in a country like Britain, if you choose, in some parts of the country, you can basically operate most of your personal economy through mutuals or co-ops. Um, we live in a small town in West Yorkshire. 
Uh, our local shop, you know, quite a, a good big one, is actually part of the co-op. Uh, we have three cooperative gas stations, filling stations within a few miles. Uh, we can uh, save with mutual societies, we can insure with a mutual, we can buy our gas and electricity from cooperatives, uh, we can even bank for a co-op. The co-op bankers have problems in Britain, that's only one part of the co-op movement which has had problems. You can actually do this already. And worldwide, it's a much bigger phenomenon. There isn't just one system, it's more complicated than that. There's also some incredibly good work being done on the kind of economies we need to function which are fairer and also low carbon. I think probably the best work being done at present is the work being done by the New Economics Foundation, uh, particularly their Great Transition Project, which is funded by the Network for Social Change, which you, some of you may be familiar with. And essentially, that is actually doing an econometric model of the British economy designed to show how you manage it to make it fairer and low carbon. That implies, of course, management at government level. And that is anathema to the free market thinking. But that is what we're going to need. Uh, there are some interesting books on this. Tim Jackson's book, Prosperity Without Growth, is a particularly good one. There's a lot of thinking going on in Britain, in Canada, in Sweden, and indeed in the United States. At the moment, it is not being taken up. Uh, but it will have to be at some time in the next five to ten years. How? I don't know. But that is, at least the thinking is being done. And the same thing, in a sense, is happening on the environmental and even on the security side as well. There's a huge amount going out uh, 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 on, on the low carbon side. One of our sons is actually a renewable energy engineer, but he's teaching at the University of the West Indies. And, you know, if you look at the worldwide problem of going low carbon, then the countries of the north, broadly the global north, and I can more or less include China in that, have got to really scale down their carbon emissions massively. But at the same time, the countries of the global south need to be enabled to develop uh, effective, fair um, economies which are better for people and are also low carbon. So you develop new kinds of economies. And there's huge scope for doing that. Um, Tom wrote a very good piece for a, a thing called The Conversation just a couple of days ago, which was talking about renewable islands in the sun. You know, Barbados is, is a country which could theoretically go uh, zero carbon in terms of all its energy use. It's possible. And some of them are starting to do this. And there are many, many other examples of doing this. Even in Britain here, we've got um, solar thermal and PV arrays on our roof. And basically, you know, produce more electricity than we consume. We export a lot back to the grid. And throughout the summer months, even on a day like today, the thermal system produces all the hot water we need. It can be done, but you need the, in, in, you, you need the encouragement of governments to make it happen quicker. Where it's happening already, almost naturally, is in many parts of the global south. Um, you, you know, the, the whole idea of using small-scale PV almost at the individual house level is being transformed. You, it, a lot of developments here in, in Kenya alone, there have been about a million of these systems sold in the last two years. That is the kind of development which is happening now. But it has to speed up hugely. And the trouble is that a number of governments are not keen on this. Our own government, the Conservative government, uh, was agreeing to some of this until it won overall control last summer, and it turned back almost all the green initiatives which had been started by the Labour government five or six years ago and continued because it was in coalition with the Liberal Democrats who basically believed more in this green kind of thinking. So temporarily in Britain, we've gone backwards. Other countries are continuing. I have to say that if dear old Donald gets in across the Atlantic, uh, that'll be goodbye to a whole range of climate change research and climate change initiatives, except in those parts of the United States, including the plains of Texas, where in fact wind power is already cheaper than, uh, than power from coal and oil. And I think there, that is the kind of change which is happening. Things could speed up very quickly there. In fact, if I try and stand back and look for optimism, I think, paradoxically, you may be slightly more optimistic about responding to climate change than responding to an economy which is not working fairly. But each has to speed up. And then the final thing, of course, is getting to grips with the control paradigm, getting to grips with the idea that you control things by force, and that is often even a fairly early option taken in pursuit of needs. Something must be done. That thing that must be done 
is bra broadly speaking military. That is the kind of it's the kind of paradigm that we're in, and we had to break out of that. Now, when you look at all that together, basically transform the world economy, go low carbon, and go more peaceful. <laughs> well, you know, I, well, well, well. Um, <laughs> but, but look at it another way. I mean, this is a Quaker community, and if, if you are not, in a sense, optimistic about the, the human spirit, I don't know who is. Uh, but remember this, I have a uh, I've only done two things which are any, any related to uh, things which I like. Coined the term lidism, and uh, I've got a definition of prophecy. The definition of prophecy is suggesting the possible. That's the phase we're in at the present time, suggesting the possible. It's a kind of prophetic role for people like you, for the few universities who are working in this, the think tanks and the rest, Oxford Research Group does a lot of work on sustainable security as well as remote control. There are groups doing this. They're not very many, but they're going to be coming to the fore more and more. Now, why am I, in a sense, fairly confident that could happen? Well, the reality is that people do wake up when it's necessary. Um, if you go back, in fact, to... Well, I'll give an experience from my youth. Uh, in 1952 in London, there was a terrible air pollution episode, the Great Smog of London. Basically, a thermal inversion formed over the London basin when most people had coal fires. It lasted four days. Uh, the, the, the capital basically closed down almost entirely. I would not have been able to see a colleague at the back uh, doing the technical stuff from where I'm standing. Five yards was the maximum visibility. And it wasn't fog, it was smog, it was filthy. Uh, Heathrow at the time was quite a small airfield. It wasn't very big. The last plane to land before they closed the airfield landed success successfully and then got lost trying to taxi to the, to the terminal. And they had to send out trucks to find it and bring it in. The cinemas in the West End closed down because people couldn't see the screen from more than a few, seat, a few rows forward. The downside was that it killed many older and bronchitic and asthmatic people. At least 4,000 people died. But it had an impact because it was on London where Parliament and the media were. And it actually led to a speeding up of all the air pollution control laws, what we call the Clean Air Act in Britain, as a result of that. That prompted a change. And there are other examples you could take. In a sense, the one I started with almost of the, uh, the, the ozone depletion issue, when people realised that would be a rapid threat, they took action. The problem is we have to do it on a much larger scale now. Um, can we do it? I, I think essentially, well, it's really from about now through into about 2030. We have 15 years to make this kind of change. Um, change has happened very quickly in the past. When people realize that it has to be done, it's more likely that it will be done. It's more likely to be done if the activists are active, the thinkers are thinking, the policy people are trying to work out how to put things into policy to prepare the way for when people realise it's got to happen. And that, I think, is why this kind of work from people like you and the rest of us is actually so important. I still just remain optimistic. Uh, but then, you know, if you ever have periods of slight pessimism, I think of, you know, our five grandchildren. The oldest is seven. The youngest two are six weeks old. All of them could be alive in the 22nd century. And what would be lovely is to think, not when you get to that age, but when they get into the 2070s and 2080s, when they're moving towards retirement, they can look back from a relatively more peaceful world and say, well, at least it was partly due to the people who were thinking and acting in the 2010s and 2020s. That's why I think it's hugely important to keep going. Thanks so much. <laughs>